Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. This is Matt Prohaska with Prohaska Consulting. Thrilled to be uh, with you and have our entire team uh, gathered and have all of you joining us for this first live workshop webinar Wednesday. Um, it'll be the first in a series and we'll talk about the series a little bit later, uh, but we wanted to give you um, a little bit of a rundown of how today's just one hour webinar will go. We'll be doing a little bit of intros and a little bit of um, background on us for the, those of you who may not know everything about Prohaska Consulting and who the heck are the folks that are putting on this, uh, this event here. Uh, we'll then get into uh, the details and the meat of our content today around how to work virtually uh, with some best practices from our organization um, and uh, a lot of our partners. Uh, we'll then uh, talk about um, next, we will uh, share some highlights from past training and present training that we've done over the last six years and tease out and share uh, a little bit of our upcoming sessions that will be part of this workshop webinar Wednesday. And then we'll open it up formally and fully for Q&A for ideally at least 10 to 15 minutes. There will be time for Q&A throughout uh, after each of our various sessions uh, and sections today. Uh, and so Renee, our hostess with the mostest, will be opening up the, uh, the phone lines and the video lines as it were as we go. Um, our rules of engagement, uh, we're gonna leverage the uh, chat function here uh, on Zoom uh, and the raise hand uh, icons, uh, either to chat privately or publicly. Uh, and we'll review certainly as we go. So we try to catch everyone asking questions or making comments throughout. Uh, and then obviously we'll open it up more during the uh, Q&A afterwards. Uh, everyone's gonna be auto muted uh, with all due respect during our presentation. So we don't have any background noise um, and distractions uh, for the actual content going through. Uh, Renee again, uh, will be uh, unmuting folks uh, as we go then in the Q&A session uh, as either folks have submitted comments or are visually raising their hands or again, using the icon uh, to raise your hand. We then uh, just wanted to point out this will be conducted live in English, um, but we have the wonderful Antonio Menuda, uh, one of our great LATAM teammates uh, who will be available um, for Spanish translation afterwards and a little bit during, uh, during the chat. Um, so special thanks to Renee and Antonio for helping us uh, with the live broadcast on this. Um, again, uh, those for the 20 or so of you that we've seen uh, that have joined just in the last two minutes since we got started, welcome. This is Matt Prohaska here, um, normally based in New York City, but based in our home in Fairfield, Connecticut uh, for today. Um, it, a little bit more about Prohaska Consulting, just to give about 90 seconds of context for this. We help every single one of our clients in one of three ways, either with their tech, their targets, or their talent. We've been privileged to be the largest programmatic consulting firm in the world. Uh, helping more than 375 clients now around the world in the past six years um, in about 30 to 40 different ways. Again, all either with tech targets or talent improvement. This is a map slightly outdated of where our teammates and clients have been over the last six years and very proud to have many in several countries uh, on this call live um, and certainly available with more than uh, 700 uh, available around the world uh, with our team uh, ready to help. So with that background, uh, I wanted to jump in and talk about how to work in uh, not the disconnected world that I know a lot of us feel personally and professionally, uh, but in a, in a connected world and how to stay connected and take advantage of the great technology and human connections that we all still have uh, available to us and that we all uh, have used uh, from time to time uh, over the years in our careers. As we know, there is no shortage uh, of either concern, uh, not just about COVID-19, of course, but concern about what this means professionally for our companies, for ourselves, for our colleagues, for our families. Um, and there's no shortage, fortunately, of help out there. Uh, we know that we're not the only company in the world that is doing a webinar with at least part of the content based on this. Um, just yesterday, our friends at Digiday uh, talked about some of the, some of the pros and cons of, of selling and buying and negotiating through this technology. Uh, we've already seen, uh, we've been using Zoom for several years now, um, but we know obviously Zoom like Peloton, a couple of the stocks that are uh, fortunately going north these days, as opposed to the majority that are, that are going south temporarily. Um, and then we've seen, of course, other great how-tos. Um, there's a PR firm out of Australia that would especially like uh, and think alike in terms of how to take advantage of, of the rhythm and the culture uh, that they've already established that we've been privileged to, uh, to create with our teammates here and that hopefully we can pass along a little bit, uh, pass along a little bit uh, to all of you. 
Um, so uh, this is where our expectation, uh, or excuse me, our experience comes from. This is a group photo, kind of symbolic of what we're doing today and what we know a lot of you are already doing or thinking about starting to do. You can see the uh, Brady Bunch. I had to look up to make sure Brady Bunch was a global reference in media from the 70s and 80s. And it looks like every country knows who the Brady Bunch is from that great TV show with the nine boxes of the family. Uh, we had about 16 boxes lined up there on the monitor on the left. This was from our all hands that we did uh, just in December of this past year. But we've had more than 250 teammates past and present already active with us in ten, more than 10 countries. We've only got four physical offices, New York, uh, London, uh, uh, Nashville, um, and, uh, and Washington, D.C., um, with everyone else working remotely, just like Nikki Hawk is right now in our new, our new Toronto office, and just like everyone else that we see on video and, and faces and text all around the world here. Um, we also have experience because we have something called the Tech Learning Series that Renee Kajowski has wonderfully run now for many years, more than 500 times every Tuesday and Friday, we have different tech companies present to us through this technology just so we can be smarter and up to speed for our clients whenever there are active or future engagements. So we've had everybody from Amazon that, of course, uh, most folks I'm pretty sure are pretty familiar with. Uh, and then just yesterday, we had Deep Root Analytics um, out of DC present to us. So, you know, we've been using this technology to be able to share um, and gather um, and create, again, connective tissue and learning opportunities and sharing opportunities with our team and for our clients for a while. So again, uh, hopefully these best practices uh, that come from our experience uh, can be additive uh, and, and at worst, uh, just more common sense and good reminders for those of you already in rhythm here. So some of the best practices, one key is to stay in real time with each other. We know it, it is uh, difficult when we are physically not connected all the time in an actual office or at a coffee shop or at a bar or at a conference or a lot of different places that we are used to engaging in real-time conversations. So some ways to stay real-time with each other. Try to share your calendars where you can. This is a quick little snapshot of just part of our team and the calendars that we have during the week so we can keep track of who's on first and who is everywhere. Use Slack or other Teams, Microsoft Teams or group text to be able to make sure that you've got some connected tissue and that you can stay in real-time so you're not having to depend on sequential uh, and consecutive conversations where people might get disjointed. Try to have your organization be as self-service as possible. Um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the pros and cons of being able to just turn to each other from one cube to the next, uh, whether it's our friends in the US or our friends in the UK, uh, pick whichever office you like the most, um, but the references are still the same. There are pros and cons with being able to just look over your shoulder and say to someone, hey, uh, wh what happened with this? Or uh, did you get that file on that? Or I can't find this. So getting your systems in place, very, very key to try and be again, very similar to the same movement in our programmatic industry broadly of moving from managed service to self-service, trying to make your, your company as programmatic as possible using tools like this. So we've, we've moved from Dropbox to OneDrive recently. Um, but a lot of file storage there, obviously. And then these are some of the examples of our CRM, our team CDP, um, who we use for project management software and then financial software to try and be able to have a place where people can go and look on their own, no matter what time zone, no matter what location she or he is in around the world, to try and get answers on their own first for two minutes tops before having to send an email to seven people or to call someone or to send one email to someone and wait 24 hours, trying to be in the moment and help people, again, continue to move, move their own ball as they go. So the, sex, the next part here we wanted to uh, touch on is specifically around this, live streaming here. Um, so we've got several tips uh, around uh, just this practice itself. And then we're gonna turn to Kelly Herrick and James Cox who lead our global recruiting practice uh, globally in New York for Kelly and out of EMEA for James to talk about some specifics in recruiting and hiring for hiring managers that we know are on this call or for folks that work with hiring managers uh, with some tips there. And then we'll get into some of the rest of our content and training um, that again will be part of deeper dive sessions throughout this series. So yeah, I, I don't know how many of you remember the famous BBC um, uh, funny uh, story where there was a reporter um, giving a, a report on something serious happening in Europe and his first daughter walked in and interrupted him in the background while he didn't know it. Then his youngest uh, scooted in on her own and then, you know, um, uh, his, someone came in and rushed in to, to brush them off. 
we all thought that was funny and oh my God, can you believe this happened on live TV? That was way back in March of 2017, three years ago. Um, that's obviously kind of common now um, as more of us are doing this from home. And so expecting that there are gonna be some disruptions and have that be part of you know, the, the charm really of what we're all going through right now and recognizing that we're all uh, working, all, almost all of us now are working from home and things are going to happen. Um, you're going to have your dog barking. I was gonna try to cue it so that our pug would bark on command and she's right outside. And if we brought food in, we could have her interrupt this, but we'll try to spare everyone. But we know that there are pets and that there are spouses that might not be in the same work rhythm as we are, but are in the same shared spaces. Um, so, you know, again, uh, having a little bit of patience and, and taking a little bit of time to smile and, and recognize that we're all going through this together. And so things are gonna come up that might disrupt that big pitch or that big discussion or that important interview or anything else we're going through is just part of, part of the new normal today. Um, let's remember please, as we've been practicing here and much appreciated to self mute when, uh, not, when, when not talking or if you need to, for example, uh, quickly cough or if you need to turn something else um, on or you know, do something quickly, you know, the mute button is just one little tap away, usually down in the lower left of either Zoom or your favorite streaming service. Um, so again, you know, try, try to be respectful with, with others and recognize that, you know, all the audio is being picked up all the time. And it's very similar to a conference call when everyone needs to talk sequentially. It's very hard to talk over each other like you, of course, can when you're sitting two feet physically in front of someone. You have to wait a little bit and give that polite pause ahead of time. And every single time there's noise in the background that tends to take up the actual Zoom window and audio of that moment. So, but, you know, just a little bit of respect and remembering that will go a long way. Utilizing your screen sharing is key. So, you know, we all are going to be continue to review dashboards and websites or LinkedIn profiles as we go through um, our, uh, our different meetings here. You know, again, uh, here on Zoom, there's a, a button four buttons away from the mute, uh, nice and green that says to share uh, as I'm doing that to someone else. Um, you know, very easy to do. The goal is to simulate this type of an experience where everyone is looking at the same screen, everyone is reviewing data or a presentation at the same time while looking at someone eye to eye on the video camera. Um, and again, being able to, you know, simultaneously present or discuss or review something at the same time is huge. So being able to screen share and still feel like you are, you know, with that person in real time going over their business uh, is pretty darn key. Um, one other key, please, um, and I don't say this as a former broadcast television guy or someone that uh, is, is a little more comfortable uh, in front of the camera with more experience than some folks, but just as someone who's been doing this like a lot of you for a long time, please turn your camera on. Um, please don't be shy. Um, the new office, FaceTime, um, you know, there are a lot of companies, we don't have it, obviously, where you feel like you need to be in front of the person or you can't leave until your boss leaves kind of thing. You know, that's a challenging culture to begin with, but certainly picking up at least in the spirit of, you know, being able to see each other and see how people are reacting is huge, like Paul Semino just did, uh, turning his camera on. So a big difference knowing that people are present and seeing all the nonverbal cues. So watching people as you're presenting for eye rolls or for people who gasp or for people who shake their head huge, or for people who smile and validate, huge as we know as human beings to be able to express each other and to see what we're each reacting to and how we're all behaving. Show your personality um, through the camera as well. So here's our teammate, Evan Herman, from an hour ago, who just, I, I asked him to take a quick little screenshot. You see him looking dapper in his animation right now um, and muted, but this was him uh, while giving, doing a meeting earlier today. He's a golfer like I am, and so he chose a particular background um, to you know, fantasize, like remember when we were all on golf courses uh, back in the day, or remember, remember maybe uh, in the winter when the weather was like this. So you know, doing that, PTI, pardon the interruption, is a show on ESPN that was one of the originals here. Having something in the background that is not overly distracting, but certainly again, allows folks to you know, look at something other than uh, my ugly mug, for example, or others. And again, you know, I've heard at least 15 times in the last two weeks, oh, sorry, my camera's not on. I haven't brushed my hair today. Like, don't worry about it. I know everyone wants to, you know, uh, spend two hours in, uh, you know, in wardrobe, uh, 
Um, but believe me, uh, see the, event, the pro of seeing each other is much greater than the con of, oh, gee, I can't believe, you know, didn't put on the rouge. Like, really, or, you know, Matt didn't put, you know, his zit cream on. Like, really not uh, uh, the point uh, at this stage. So, you know, again, turning the camera on, uh, we, we, uh, we, we applaud and, and ask um, internally and uh, with respect to anybody else that we're meeting with. Um, one thing that I uh, have failed in most of this uh, discussion already to do um, is to talk 10% slower than you usually do. Our team and people that know me know that I get a little bit like John Mashita here, who, uh, this is another old guy media reference. Um, he is the fast talker who did the FedEx commercials way back in the day on television. Um, slow it down a little bit. Using a broadcast voice means that talking at this pace, as opposed to this pace, actually will help everyone receive your messages a lot better and will allow people to pause and interject uh, and interrupt where appropriate uh, or and get an actual dialogue going instead of feeling like there's just an onslaught of, of uh, audio and video coming at you and it's tough to get a word in edgewise. Paying attention as we just discussed to the group in private chat. So fortunately there's no need for a moderator. Um, it's funny, I was using this analogy with, uh, with one of our uh, industry friends who's on this uh, uh, web stream already that we know. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I was telling him, I said, yeah, because uh, he was explaining how his company is still using a lot of audio-based calls. And the difference, uh, the analogy I used is when, uh, remember when, uh, remember uh, for, again, older people like me, uh, before we had ATMs and cash machines, um, when we first started getting cash out of a machine, imagine if we had to go back and get cash through a, an actual bank. I mean, forget about COVID, but imagine if we had to go to a bank and a teller and take out $40 or drive through and get those pneumatic tubes, if you remember that. Like, that's what it feels like going back to an audio-based call versus a video streaming call here. I mean, how many times is it painful the first three to five minutes of a call for the moderator to say, you know, after hearing the boop, boop, hi, who just joined? Uh, oh, it's uh, Steve. Oh, okay, hey, Steve. We have these seven people on the call and we're waiting for the next three. We have fortunately panels and Zoom like other services are great at being able to see who's on and who's off. So everyone can kind of see and you can just move on um, like, uh, like we are here. Um, one uh, you know, added bonus that we know not everyone has because um, we know only about 10% of companies even in our industry are using this today. Uh, we've been using it for a few years now and it's been huge that Scott Bender and a lot of our other uh, leaders uh, have, uh, have instituted and that is an AI-based voice recognition service to handle note-taking. Um, the new type of multitasking in a meeting uh, is using a service like, you know, either Voicea, who we used before. It was started by uh, a few guys that uh, used to work at Blue Kai, if you remember that DMP, now part of Oracle way back in the day. Um, Voicea sold to WebEx, and we've recently switched over to Notive. There are plenty of other great services as well. But being able to, you know, not everyone can be a fantastic Paul Semino or Ellen Oppenheim on our team and take fantastic notes um, or an Amit Shaw or an Evan Herman and popping them into Mavenlink in real time or right after the fact. So being able to have a service like this means that we can spend the time looking at each other, pulling up other documents, you know, staying a little more present without having to feel like, oh my God, I didn't get that last thought. Um, specifically uh, to that point though, one other thing you wanna do before recording would be to make sure obviously you're asking your, your teammates or your clients, especially permission to record. Um, we don't wanna be uh, like this um, and thought of as holy cow, what just happened to me? Um, and clients giving sensitive information and then wondering what that little recording thing is or who the extra person is that's sitting with a 415 phone number when it's no teeth. Um, you know, the goal again is to just use that, get there okay ahead of time, of course, quick little courtesy. And then the bonus is you can start the meeting on time and you don't have to wait 10, 15 minutes for someone else to join. They can just pick up the recording as you go. So that's the summary here of uh, our best practices. Um, we've got them listed out for you here. Again, like this entire webinar, uh, Renee and the rest of our uh, great team will be sending this out to all of you. Uh, and to those of you who did register but chose to get the on-demand version and couldn't join us live. Um, so with that, I wanted to toss to Kelly Herrick, uh, who with James Cox 
um, lead out our recruiting practice. Kelly's been with us five years and I've been proud to know her almost 20 now. Um, she's based in New York. James recently joined us after, uh, after uh, and while uh, having his own successful recruiting practice in London uh, and handles our EMEA business. And Kelly is going to lead out here with James talking about how to recruit and also do some other uh, hiring best practices uh, in, uh, in some uncertain times. Kelly? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. And I know this is a really unusual time and can be very, very stressful when there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, the one thing I, just to give you a little bit of background about me, um, I've been recruiting for about 20 years and specialize in digital media, advertising and emerging technology. I actually started my company two months prior to 9-11. Um, so I basically went in at, at, and started a company at an incredibly un uncertain time. And even during that time, I was able to find business. And I'd like to just talk about um, how to maneuver through something like this. So basically, um, in any Anytime there, there are always hiring things that go on. Usually when there's uncertainty and upheaval, like I would categorize now, um, a lot of companies trim unnecessary overhead, you know, get rid of, get rid of, uh, of expenses that are maybe not needed and really focus on revenue generation. So what I would suggest is taking a look at your bottom line, figuring out who really can impact and drive revenue and who can help you keep the lights on and is strong operationally. Also, um, there are times when, un unfortunately, you, you do have to make tough decisions and always um, looking at the bottom line and, and figuring out where you need to cut in order to, to keep your business healthy and to, you know, make it through, make it through the, uh, the current economic climate. So basically, um, in any in any uh, upside on this is there are always needs even at the worst time. Uh, you know, I always categorize it. I know it's a recession when when certain jobs go away and everything has the tendency to fall back into business development or, or revenue generation type, type of role. So I think probably what's happening now are a lot of people are looking at their top producers, wanting to retain them and look for other people who can, who can help them, you know, achieve success and, and uh, keep, keep them profitable. Um, one thing that um, I, I always think in this kind of situation, you need somebody who's a self-starter who can work from home and then people um, who who are strong operationally and who can help you keep keep your business running, and um, just make sure that you can make it through the the uncertainty. Um, so this is one one upside on on this is um, because everybody's at home and because there there is a a captive audience, so to speak. If there's been somebody that you've been trying to get in touch with or that you've been trying to recruit, there's a really good chance you'll be able to get that person on the phone or in a video conference now. Uh, a lot of people will be much more available than they normally are. So I would use this as an opportunity to reach out. And also, it's uh, it's stating the obvious, but this is, this is a very traumatic for, for most people. And so you obviously want to make sure that everybody's being sensitive to that and knowing that people are under a large amount of stress. So uh, obviously, you know, make sure that somebody's healthy and that their family's healthy and, and confirm that it's an okay time to speak, but let them, let them know that you're available to, as a resource and, you know, Again, stating the obvious, but but always be kind. I, I have people come to me all the time, and it's 
sometimes I just don't have the right opportunity or the right, the right um, role at the right time, but I always try to be a resource and always try to educate them on what's going on and things really can come around. So um, to that, if, um, and the, the one, one last thing is in good times recruiting is hard and in bad times recruiting can be hard so i would always look at this as an opportunity to to assess and really try to try to figure out what you need to keep keep the lights on and to keep every everything healthy and please don't hesitate to use us as a resource and let me know if you have any questions all right thanks and i hope all of this made sense Matt, do you have any questions or do you want to jump back in? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Um, anything, uh, James, for perspective? I know, um, you know, uh, one thing at least, again, that we all have in common is that there are, uh, there are pros and cons and challenges and opportunities uh, no matter what country we're based in, right? Yeah, totally. I just like to say hello. Unfortunately, I spent two hours doing my hair and makeup and I can't be seen. The video is not working, so I'm hugely disappointed. Ah, all that but, might have Hello to everybody. Yeah, I'm James. I've been doing recruitment for about 19 years, started off in IT, then got into financial recruitment, then defected to media. And uh, yeah, so I started off in, you know, publishing and then everything went digital programmatic. I bought companies like XLA and Blue Kai, Zaxis, AppNexus, growing their teams in Europe, uh, to mention a few. But I think Kelly's hit the nail on the head with everything she said. But Today, you know, some real light, uh, you know, this, obviously this COVID-19 is, is a horrendous situation, but um, every cloud has a silver lining. I've, today's yielded three amazing candidates I've been after for some time. Uh, they're based in Germany. I have a few roles in Germany. Uh, some have been postponed, but I'm still working on two, which is hugely positive. And three candidates that I've been after have taken the time to speak to me. I've, uh, so I'm really excited about that because as Kelly said, they haven't got the distractions of their current job in terms of being totally surrounded by their workmates and colleagues, you know, invariably you can get hold of them. So I think it's a really good time for us as headhunters to go to market and find people who, normally wouldn't respond to an advert you know this is what we do we, we go to market we unearth people and i think you know today proof in point that people who wouldn't normally respond or who would you normally get to represent are responding so that's hugely positive i mean on the flip side of course companies are postponing um roles which i totally understand but from a candidate perspective kelly's completely right it's a great time to find great talent Great, thanks James. And uh, as mentioned, there will be a future um, workshop webinar Wednesday, just talking about recruiting for hiring managers and companies, and then on career search uh, and how to do that um, in these times, as well as, as we all know, a lot of life is supply and demand. And certainly the, you know, the, there's, there's a shift at least temporarily um, around uh, the supply of talent available versus the demand of jobs. Um, but again, it's early relatively speaking, and we hope uh, and are optimistic that a lot of folks uh, will be uh, continuing to be on offense and recognize the upside, not just in getting more mind share uh, with candidates, um, but also uh, for hiring managers to take advantage of, of the time that folks have where uh, they certainly might be uh, looking a little more at their own careers than on an average Wednesday. Thank you, Kelly and James. Um, wanted to, uh, before we toss to Paul Samina, wanted to uh, ask and, and see if we can take a shot at taking one or two live questions on audio and or video here, or if Renee, there was anything relevant from the questions that have already been submitted ahead of time, uh, or during, I've been checking the chat as we go. Um, otherwise, we can, uh, if not, we can proceed to uh, Paul Samina to talk about customer data platforms. All right, great. We're going to give uh, the usual three, four second uh, courtesy pause there for anyone to jump in and uh, let's continue. So I uh, wanted to uh, introduce Paul Samina or reintroduce him to many that I see of the, uh, of the 50 plus attendees that are still live with us or are still coming on uh, and to many of you who will be seeing this on demand um, who doesn't need much of an introduction, but Paul was one of the, one of the, uh, first uh, folks in the world to create a DMP or data management platform with Brillig, 
way back in the day when I had the first uh, had the privilege of meeting him and getting to know him. Uh, Brillig was sold to Merkel, uh, now part of uh, the uh, the uh, the agency holding company conglomerate and doing very very well. And now Paul has been on his own for about five years and thrilled that he's been leading our global data strategy for just about that exact long uh, amount of time as well. So Paul and I have been talking for several years uh, about uh, launching this training program, CDP University. Um, we both went to Syracuse, so that's why the uh, banner would be a little bit of blue and orange there on the bottom left. Uh, we took a little bit of creative liberty last year on this, but we uh, launched it in January uh, with our first live successful full day event in January. And this will be uh, our first new webinar uh, coming, uh, coming on board here. Um, in our next series next week. Uh, Paul, you want to share some highlights of uh, what we've been uh, sharing and what we've learned uh, over the years? Absolutely. Uh, pleasure to be here with you all. I, I wish it was under better circumstances. I'm in Austin, Texas, which it, it'll be 80 degrees today and I might play golf. So we are, you know, but we're keeping our distance. Um, so yeah, and I am just 30 seconds about my background. So I have been in interactive media, e-commerce, <clears throat> digital marketing, um, going back to the early 90s, believe it or not, um, and uh, used to build websites and then went into media and then into data. Um, so I've sort of been around the data equation my whole career. Uh, prior to that, I started my career as a buyer at Saks Fifth Avenue, which was, you know, data-driven multi uh, luxury marketing. Um, and yeah, the, the concept of a CDP, oh, one, one tip for Zoom, because Zoom is a very, I, I work mostly remotely, as Matt said. There's a feature on Zoom that I discovered the other day, which is people struggle to unmute themselves, but you can actually hit your space bar, and it's, it, it's like a military radio where you come off Zoom, and then when you let go of the space bar, you uh, go back on mute. So just, if you're ever panicked to hit that, you know, to get, somebody's like, you know, are, is he there? Is he, is he muted? Can he, you know, just use the space bar. Um, so, Yes, uh, going back to Brillig, um, we saw sort of what people are calling the identity crisis. Um, and and uh, I actually wrote an article in 2014 called, the, saying basically the cookie would be um, obsolete in five years, which the timing was a little off, but it, and it wasn't that I'm clairvoyant. We just saw in our data, because Brillig, even though it was a small DMP data exchange, it was, it was you know, reaching, I don't know, we had, at 1.700 million devices connected to the database, um, around 50,000 segments, um, and we probably had, I don't know, 50 or 100 things about each row or device, and we could just see as mobile was happening and as all these um, different things that were fragmenting addressability of media and segmentation, it was gonna be a real challenge for the industry to hang on to this, um, the cookie and, and the, because I was an e-commerce person, I also saw that the cookie was actually a first party device that, that we sort of old timers created to maintain shopping carts. Um, we're talking, like I started building e-commerce websites in 94, 95, and it was a bummer for customer service. If you went to some time, you went through time, you put stuff in your shopping cart, maybe you went somewhere else when you came back, the shopping cart was empty, it was a bummer. First party cookie. Then the, when the first banners were launched, they needed a way to track how many times the banner had been viewed, and they um, invented the third party cookie and the rest is history. Um, so just uh, talking about CDPs, um, Prohaska has a somewhat unique uh, perspective on it uh, that, because it's, it is another acronym and there are other sort of synonyms or things that are related to it like data lake um, and uh, the way that we view CDPs is really sort of the first business case is the, the CRM marketing engine, which is still sort of a number of things. It's email, it's, um, it's, it's a number of things. It's the melding together of the, what Prohaska, if you're looking at advertising from paid, owned, and earned standpoint, the owned media is, if you could just go back, um, where, wherever the CRM information is sitting, melding that together with digital inside of a data lake and then putting different applications on top of it is what we think of as a CDP. And I'll talk a little bit about business cases in a second. Um, so, 
And then moving on, uh, we, we sort of use this brain metaphor, uh, which the, the diagram on the left is all of the fragment, fragmented types of media, paid, owned, earned, everything. And, and you pretty much have, for any brand, you have um, many channels, many screens, many identity providers, many um, data providers, many sources, and many places where you can place media. So what, what seems to be happening is the, the first iteration of the CDP, or of even if you just think about it as enterprise marketing, or solid state marketing, or altogether marketing, is CRM data coming together with digital data. Um, and that's, that's sort of the, those are a lot of the business cases that we're seeing and that we're working on and that and, um, you're seeing different vendors from the CRM space coming into the digital space, calling themselves CDPs. And you're seeing digital people trying to get to the CRM side, calling themselves CDP. So it's a little bit of a wild west right now. The way we think of it is enterprise marketing. Um, the other part of this that we're seeing that's, pretty consistent is that this is about first party enterprise marketing, the CDP. Um, and if, if you just remember back to my uh, statement of the CDP being the CRM place where digital uh, and CRM comes together, that's really about the mid funnel. Um, the market is still fantastic about building awareness, whether that's through linear TV over the top, you know, uh, brand marketing is very solid. There's so many choices and DSPs have just done a fantastic job along with the, the wall gardens. And then also at the bottom of the funnel, loyalty, you know, conversion to acquisition, prospecting and, and converting people from uh, consideration level consumers to customers is very solid state. What's broken is the middle. Where, where do you go from brand marketing, which doesn't have a lot of data around it. It's mostly geo, it's very loose. How do you get that into the lower funnel? That's where the CDP is key. And the first business case that we talked about of CRM and digital coming together is key. The other thing is first party is, is important. So this is a little bit of an eye chart of sort of all of the elements that are attached to and um, uh, that are involved in CDPs. Um, and what I want you to leave with, if anything, is that this is first party, meaning when you think about the way that you get data into a data lake, there has to be some kind of an input mechanism, whether it's a pixel or server to server or whatever, that that data is owned, is tagged, owned, and, and uh, retrievable by your company, by the brand or by the publisher, depending on your side of the equation. So first party data. Um, and the other key element is this is about identity. So addressability, whether you're talking about the, 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 the sort of um, the constrictions around cookies, whether they're government regulations, whether they're ad blockers, whether they're the, the browsers being more restricted about their car, party cookies, you have to have some kind of a strategy that's first party to build an identity technology that allows you to access the market. So some people will call that a graph, meaning you have like a little Rosetta Stone of things that allows you to talk to other people's data. That's yours. Um, we think that is key. So identity and addressability have to be first party. Um, it's, it's on the system in the, in the sort of lower right, the other key element that we talk about and that we're actually in the middle of deploying for a number of people is machine learning, which is a million things, but it's really, what it does is it gives you the ability to identify or segment um, in a proprietary manner on your first party data um, in a way that fills in the blanks or does look like modeling. And this technology has existed for a while, but making that your own is very, is very key. Um, and we have a lot of examples of that. Thank you, Paul. So just to, uh, to, to wrap this up, I do want to get to, I know we want to make sure uh, we, uh, we not give away too much of, uh, or uh, provide too much from uh, what CDP University will be doing in at least a two hour session in a future webinar. Um, but as Paul was saying, that getting uh, all, you can tell, getting all of those different uh, data silos, but also the human beings that run those departments together in a new rhythm where you do these five stages. Um, the neat part is that uh, as we've taught and as we've shown and seen with our publisher clients as well, 
the same five stages apply to publishers when utilizing CDPs for themselves as well. We've been privileged to help Vivo the last couple of years um, in building out a custom CDP for them uh, and for other publishers. And so these same five steps uh, are the same uh, that apply whether you're a brand, whether you're an agency partner helping those brands, uh, or again, uh, a publisher, and where the best CDPs that we've found uh, help uh, with uh, activating, uh, and then also strategizing ahead of that, and then most importantly, optimizing. So thank you, Paul, um, for, for, for that, yeah. and also, again, the years of helping build out this curriculum together. Um, we're gonna hold off on questions because I wanna be sensitive to everybody's time, and um, I know we only have 17 minutes left. We do have two other quick uh, items we wanted to get to before opening it up for Q&A. So, over the next two to three minutes, we'd love to toss to Jason White, uh, based out in Palm Springs, California. Uh, many of you know him having uh, been the man at CBS and running uh, a great department, leading the programmatic and other practices there for many years. We've been thrilled that for the last few months, Jason's been a part of our team, helping build out uh, a lot of the identity solutions, either for the whole industry or for individual clients. And Jason wanted to just give a little bit of a, of a context here and to set Jason up a little bit, um, you know, and, and to identify kind of why we've uh, gotten to this place, as uh, Paul and a couple others have already highlighted, we know that we have three companies who are doing pretty darn well, uh, COVID or not, um, in winning a lot of ad dollars, not just in the US and UK, but really every single developed country outside of mainland China. And why is that? Well, they have the best deterministic identity, and they've done the best job of attribution and measurement. Um, we think these are the two largest challenges in the entire industry, especially when you um, uh, create an accelerator like one company's browser uh, deciding to give a two-year deadline about a two-year deadline uh, to be able to shut off uh, third-party cookies. So fortunately, uh, necessity is the mother of invention and a lot of uh, firms and the entire industry in many uh, countries have now started to rally around what a post-cookie world would look like. Uh, Jason, you want to walk through uh, a little bit of where we've been helping our clients? Absolutely, Matt. Thanks for the intro, and uh, everyone. Great to uh, great to join you this Wednesday, and uh, and wish the best to you all. And again, wish we were under different uh, uh, different uh, situations and times, but um, all the best to everyone there, and I hope everyone's families are safe. <clears throat> so, when we look at kind of the momentum of uh, first party, piggybacking on what Paul was talking about earlier. Um, at the heart of everything that's driven uh, my interest in this from CBS and beyond um, has always been exactly what Matt was talking about, uh, being able to get to a deterministic place, um, understanding that the world of the cookie is our enemy um, as a publisher. Um, and three years ago, started having conversations with a lot of the largest publishers, platforms, and agencies out there on how we can partner together uh, to build a more sustainable ecosystem that's deterministic, um, that's accountable, um, that is privacy and compliant. Um, and so when we kind of look at the solutions that is presented to us now, we have an event horizon, uh, you know, piggybacking on what Matt was talking about earlier, um, the end of the cookie as we know it. Uh, we see this as an opportunity that we can re-architect or rebuild the uh, platforms uh, across platform across the ecosystem. Um, so this is going to center on trust. Uh, we have to have trust and the consumer um, at the front of any solution that we put into the marketplace. Um, if we don't have that, um, then it's no better than the cookie um, and anything that we've done before. Um, education is paramount. Um, educating all of the uh, individual members wherever they reside in the ecosystem will get to some of those individual entities as it relates to programmatic shortly. Uh, but everybody has to be accountable, um, ensuring that both uh, the marketers and the publishers um, have agreed upon compliance standards. This is going to be important and this is the road that lies in front of us. Um, and of course, content is key. Going to the next slide, please. So what we basically built is we built an ID transaction flow um, of, and we kind of use the, I'm just an email on Capitol Hill reference to Schoolhouse Rocks for those of you that are uh, Gen X and, uh, and below. Um, we have our email kind of going through the ecosystem here. Um, as the consumer, uh, consumer comes to the publisher's site, the publisher offers a value proposition at CBS. Uh, what we wanted to do to acquire more first party email addresses uh, was to offer um, our SVOD product all access for free, potentially for 30 days. Now this is a test. 
uh, but we have to start somewhere to incentivize the user to create that relationship with us. Um, this obviously would be encrypted. Um, it would be secure uh, through our SSO provider. Um, and then we would ultimately convert that into an ID, an ID that can be sent along to an SSP. Um, an SSP would ultimately receive that ID. They have their own integrations with identity resolution providers like LiveRamp, like Brightpool. Um, and that would be passed securely and safely onto the DSP. And at this point, this is where the marketer can use the DSP to target these IDs, just like they do with a cookie today. However, uh, the advantage that they have is that they actually know that it's that individual user. Um, an example that I always use is when I come to my home computer and even when I come to my laptop or even some of the tablets that we have, um, it thinks that I am a Nordstrom high heel shoe shopper um, and I have no desire uh, to get retargeted ads with uh, high heel shoes. I mean, they're pretty. Um, I think they're great for my wife, uh, but they're not what I want to see in terms of a custom tailored experience um, when I'm online. So as you can imagine, when you get, get into a future state, um, individual consumers are going to be able to log into their individual sites and they're going to be able to see a customized experience. Not only does this have value from a consumer perspective, but think about it from an advertiser's perspective, how much better their performance is going to be when they have that verified, deterministic, authenticated user. Um, so the sky's the limit, and we see this as the future for publishers to band together. Obviously, a lot more to come into this space. So we just wanted to give you kind of a snippet of the way that we see the world going and how we're going to be having conversations across the ecosystem, DSPs, SSPs, uh, DMP ad delivery platforms, measurement platforms, attribution platforms in order to make this a reality. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, we were privileged and proud to do some very early work uh, with the Ivy Tech Lab. Uh, so some of you may have seen some of this, um, at least in part or in theory, uh, from their announcements at the annual leadership meetings just about five weeks ago now, six weeks ago. Um, we're thrilled uh, that they are continuing on and we're proud to be helping others now um, going forward with how they individually or collectively uh, can move towards uh, this great new world. Uh, so thank you, Jason. Uh, let's move quickly to Scott Bender and our last uh, quick little section tease out here. We again, just similar to CDP University, we will have a deeper dive on how to help folks uh, solving their own uh, identity, either crisis or prepare for this nice evolution or revolution around identity. Uh, wanna, we're also proud uh, that in our six years, we're pretty darn sure we have trained more sellers and buyers and operators uh, than anyone uh, independently uh, driven in the world on how to do it programmatically. Uh, and that's been in, in great part, thanks to Scott Bender. <laughs> Many years and uh, is ready to share a few thoughts on how to sell programmatically. Yeah. Great, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Um, good afternoon and good morning. Um, great to be here, even under these challenging circumstances and hope everybody's doing, um, doing well. Anyway, when we talk about different sales efforts, I think whether you, you, know, you want to talk about them as stages or tasks, they can be broken out into really different elements. And whether you're selling digital, selling programmatic, or selling linear TV, or even go back to my days of selling local radio, they haven't changed. And when you go through these things, obviously there's prospecting in terms of are you talking to the right people? Um, are you talking, so whether it is the person, and when we talk about programmatic direct versus direct IO sales, is it the person at the digital, that owns the digital budget, is it the person at the trading desk, is it the person at the separate account group, is it the video investment team, um, is it in the case of emerging platforms like digital out of home or audio, um, is it a managed service DSP, so are you looking at the right folks, are you talking to the right folks, are you going to where the money is, so that's first and foremost, so again, doesn't change, then we get into pitching, if are you asking the right questions how are you measure how are they measuring their kpis how are they looking at attribution and performance of the campaign how are they working with their own first party data or second party data partners or as referenced before are they working with the cdp um asking and understanding having an, an understanding of again how are they looking at this campaign moving forward so how is your performance going to be judged and then if we get into just proposing um is your offering clear versus the world of direct io um, or even linear TV, where we've all you know, been experienced or been a part of these general media kits and 30-page reports. In the case of programmatic direct, the five stages of programmatic direct sales, it's really about you know, uh, a clear, simple, synthesized offering. Which SSPs or platforms are you working with? Um, you know, 
which, uh, what type of pricing model are you working with, whether it's programmatic guaranteed or programmatic direct, it's a one sheet. It's not 30 pages. And it's very, very quick and, and simple and to the point. And that's how you have to consider when you look at programmatic direct, whether it's private marketplace or other different types of auction models, that's, that's, the where, that's how it's set up. Then you get into the next stage is closing and launching from proposing. You go to the, uh, the, and that's really, really very simply. And I think our world, whether it's selling TV or selling a direct IO, it's always been about, you know, you close the deal, you throw it over to the operations team over to the side and you set it and forget it and you move on to your next deal. In programmatic direct sales, that is not the case. You uh, have to make sure that it is actually meeting the expectations. It's generating the audience, the impressions that you expected expected it to get. So you cannot set it and forget it. And it's not a matter of checking two weeks from now or a month from now. It's checking the next day to go ahead and find out if it's actually meeting the expectations of what it's supposed to be doing. And then finally, it's op optimizing and upselling um, in terms of, you know, how is there more, more of an opportunity to drive more dollars? One of the challenges that people bring up to me constantly about programmatic dollars or direct dollars versus direct IO is that like, these dollars aren't guaranteed unless it's maybe pr programmatic guaranteed. You're right, they're not guaranteed. Just as though you may lose those dollars over the course of a quarter, you actually could go back and drive more additional dollars. Budgets are dynamic. They're not quarterly. You're not, you're gonna, you don't need to wait back till the next uh, quarter to see if something works. That's why it's a matter of coming back, having conversations, and in this world that we're now operating on more of a virtual sense, certainly picking up the phone, having a, an email with them and saying, how are we doing? Um, how's this audience performing? Would you go ahead and like more? So certainly a great opportunity in, to, you know, again, be involved and, uh, and drive more budgets and drive more business. Bottom line with all of this, just as you've seen with all these stages, um, you know, while the way we're, met, you know, transacting through business on a programmatic basis is changing, at the same time, you still need human interaction. You still need people, whether it's in person or virtual, to go ahead and drive these deals. So we can get into this in a lot more detail in, uh, in future webinars, but at least wanted to give you kind of a, a sense of what we're talking about here in this new world. Thanks, Matt. Great, and thank you, Scott. Um, we've been privileged to teach uh, sellers in now 12 countries um, how to do this. And the neat part about uh, what we've built over the last six, seven years is that, uh, as you can see, um, whether it's programmatic or not, these same five stages apply. It's not like, as we always say, you know, to do programmatic selling, you have to go into some special, uh, well, we always used to joke that you used to go in some special air chamber, put on a Martian helmet and do programmatic for two hours and then come out and, well, that was kind of crazy, and then go about your normal day. What we're seeing is that uh, we've been able to show folks that programmatic selling is just how everyone's going to be doing their job, but you can use programmatic tactics and methods uh, and data um, and transaction types uh, to be and, and technology to be able to use the, utilize these same five stages throughout your day. So thank you, Scott. Um, uh, that session, uh, Deeper Dive, along with what you heard with Jason White in Identity, Paul Semino in CDP, you can see uh, whether it's going to be Nikki Hawk, Aaron Yazgar, and others around programmatic buying, um, a digital out of home that we were privileged to launch uh, back in November with our friends at the DPAA and are looking to do globally now with them and others. Um, you can see all of the different sessions here that we've built out. Again, very subject to change, obviously, as we look to uh, secure underwriting partners and uh, and sponsors for uh, being able to make this either low or no cost uh, to all of you, our audience on this globally, and build momentum based on your feedback. So again, we've got attribution and measurement that's coming. We've got content marketing with our new teammate, Alan Shulman uh, from Deloitte Digital, a great, great agency and consulting background and creative mind uh, for more than three decades and, and privileged to have him uh, a part of our team now. And you can see some of the other sessions that we've, uh, that we've got planned for you. Um, what we wanted to do is, is uh, take, uh, again, the remaining five minutes here, apologies that we scrunched it a little bit shorter than we wanted to, and actually stop talking and do a little more listening and open things up. But uh, Renee, I believe we already have one, uh, one first question that came through the chat from Lindsay. If Renee is on pause, I'll go ahead and answer it. Yes, time. sorry about that. Yes, uh, one of the questions that had come through um, prior to the call was, um, was how can we sway brands to continue to invest in our digital branding services at this time? Yeah, I think it's the same answer um, that we highlighted. Uh, thank you, Lindsay, for that and Renee. Um, yeah, it's the same answer uh, that we give, uh, that we touched on a little bit with recruiting. It's the same thing we tell our team now. It's the same thing uh, why, you know, usually the first two things that get pulled back 
in times of recession or other challenging times of uncertainty are let's pull back the ad spending and let's pull back the recruiting and hiring people, stop everything. Well, yeah, those are two easy uh, expenses to, to uh, remove, but what we've seen over 30 years plus is that in every single downtime, those that continue advertising, obviously changing your creative to be sensitive and appropriate and contextually relevant in the times, but those who continue marketing and those who continue hiring are those that actually gain greater when times are better because they have already set themselves up more for success. So I would look at it certainly and, you know, like everything, personalize it. So, you know, if, if, if there's a specific brand, Lindsay, that you're looking at and working with and trying to continue persuading them, uh, certainly the decisions are usually not made at the media planner or television buyer uh, basis. It's obviously made at the CMO, CEO level at this point, CFO level. So, you know, having, you know, having teammates or yourself to be able to move up the food chain a little bit with respect and recognize that, you know, a lot of instruction is being passed down very quickly. So a lot of times people who are giving you somewhat uh, temporarily tough news aren't really in control of that decision anyway at this point. Um, so, you know, finding a way to be able to convince and show folks just to create math and history uh, and common sense that again, continuing to invest in your great brand and environment, continuing to hire, continuing to be on offense versus defense will work out even more and the ROI is actually greater than it is in normal times because you're capturing larger share of mind and share of voice. Thanks again for the question. Anything else that we've got uh, opening it up to uh, anyone else here? I know uh, still more than 45 live with us here with only a couple of minutes to go. And I'm sure, again, other submissions that we'll get to in uh, future sessions or we'll follow up individually with you. You know, Matt, one of the things that also came up is what kind of reporting should we, we be run to share with executives? Yeah, so, you know, most dashboards, uh, you know, again, due to people's time, focus, and attention um, to avoid, uh, you, know, uh, you know, giving too much data, um, certainly, you know, uh, keeping dashboards at a high level so that people are able to very quickly understand uh, at a macro level what the, what the top uh, KPIs are performing and, and where things are changing. Sales forecasts uh, being up to date in Salesforce or whatever your CRM is, is certainly kind of important right now as, again, people are looking to see where budgets are and how revenue targets are either still closing up here in Q1 or, or you know, Q2 and remaining quarters this month. So, you know, the, whatever your dashboard service is, um, either hacking one together or working with other great services like Adomo or Datarama or others, you know, making sure that you've quickly still got that same rhythm like we talked about earlier, being able to either share it live during web stream, uh, live streams and webinars like this, or to be able to get out reports that have people, no matter what part of the world they're in, no matter how hunkered down they are at their home, they can get to the data that can help uh, understand what's happening, what's going to be happening, so that people can take action very efficiently. Great. And Anything, up. You know, I know and just for Haska teammates and Renee doing a great job, uh, you know, monitoring the phones as, as we used to say in radio days. Um, any other questions live from folks or that have come in to Renee? Yeah, there is a little Q&A button if you want to type a question in. You're more than welcome to do so. Um, I'm just going through some of the questions that were sent through uh, when people registered. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to fill in with another one. If anybody wants to add a question in the Q&A, please do so. Um, one of this was, uh, it kind of refers back to the first part of our presentation, which is it, these are challenging times. Um, Insights on how to lead through ambiguity is part one, um, and um, I will follow up with a part two on that. Yeah, I would say three things, and again, it's a reminder to myself, it's a reminder to, to me, it's a reminder to all of our global team leads that run our different regions and departments, um, and it's three things. It's be transparent so that people know exactly how you're feeling, what's going on, and what's not going on. Be consistent um, so that people know that you're going to do what you say you're going to do because with a lot of uncertainty, being able to rely on each other is obviously very key. Um, and being optimistic, obviously, uh, and recognizing with perspective that we will all get through our individual, our family, our corporate, our country, and our global uh, challenges today um, and be coming out um, just fine and stronger. So I would highlight those three things and hopefully that can apply to 
any organization, big or small, at any stage, startup or, uh, or, uh, or 30 years old um, and in, in any industry. Um, what I'm going to ask is, uh, I know we're a few minutes past here, so um, I'll ask if, if for any other follow-up questions, feel free to continue using the chat or I'll give you my personal info here at the end. I do want to wrap up though and respect everyone's time since you've been with us an hour plus now. Uh, I especially want to thank three people who've been a part of this. You can see the three of them here. You've already heard from Renee, um, Nikki Hawk, uh, our new six weeks on the job uh, CMO and head of our marketer and agency strategy who helped with Christine Volden and Renee pull all this together in literally 48 hours um, after we had this idea over the weekend, uh, literally. Uh, we had always wanted to do it, but we thought um, now is a pretty good time to institute it. So much appreciated to the three of them, along with 15 at least more uh, teammates around the world who have used one of our five core values of hustling for sure uh, to pull this together. Um, and with that, the last uh, thing I'll, I'll mention here um, is that we've certainly, uh, as you've heard a theme, been through this before. Uh, you've heard from folks who sound very young, but certainly have been around a number of years in their career and in life. And whether it was the 1991 recession where I graduated college in 92 and was told by our dean during commencement, you were born at the wrong time. Sorry, there's a recession and it's gonna be really tough for you. Um, we got through that. Whether it was those of us who remember March of 2000, um, when the NASDAQ was at 5,000, and, and that was a crazy high at the time, uh, when the early uh, first kind of 1.0.com bubble burst, and we had those challenges, we got through that. I think we all know what happened on 9-11, and so we all got through that relatively strong, um, and, and hopefully where we weren't personally impacted with our family and friends too much, but at least economically, uh, we moved on and were able to pick ourselves up from that. Um, and then just 11 years ago, frankly, the last time we had a recession, uh, due to the financial crisis, we got through that. Um, so the theme is um, we're all going to get through this together, uh, no matter whether you're part of our firm, part of our competition, uh, so-called competition, uh, part of the industry, friends, um, you know, we will all uh, move together forward with our families and our loved ones um, and everyone in this industry and in all. So uh, the last message we wanted to say is the one that we meant to open with, and that is certainly you, as you heard from our teammates in their opening comments, wishing you and yours, your family, your teammates, and your partners uh, a very healthy and safe uh, time. Um, please let us know what we can do first personally for you to help you, and then professionally, if you need some help along the way, uh, you know we'll be here. So with that, I wanted to thank everyone a part of Prohaska Consulting. wanted to thank the 60 plus that were part of this live uh, with 24 hours notice, and for all of you, we'll be seeing the sign on demand. Take care, stay healthy, and stay safe. Thank you.